我が生まれるメガドライブだけに許された超大型ロールプレイングゲーム「バーンメリオン」Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Ultimate Sega Genesis Review here on Player One Start. Today, we're going to talk about role playing games, puzzle games, and strategy simulation games. I feel that all of these games fit kind of a specific overall genre of strategy. These games are not ones that necessarily require you to be quick on your feet. And just spring into action. Some of these games are going to require a lot of strategy. And these are the kind of games that I think that some of the puzzle thinkers would actually be more into. Now, I'm not saying that everyone who is into role playing games will like puzzle games, and everyone who likes puzzle games will like simulation games. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying they kind of fit an overall play style that is unique to these genres.
So getting right to the gameplay, let's go ahead and start with role-playing games. I will note that I actually didn't play these games a lot as a kid because I wasn't a big fan of the genre. I actually, when I was in my college years, came back and played a whole bunch of these early 90s RPGs, and I became a huge fan of them. I don't think that a lot of people have heard of some of these games, so let's go ahead and take a look. Alright, so everyone would probably yell and scream if I didn't include anything about the Fantasy Star series, but I'm going to let you know this right now. I've never played it. This was my first time. Please be gentle. That said, Fantasy Star 2 is a role-playing game developed and published by Sega for the Sega Genesis. It was released in Japan and North America in the same year of 1989, but it didn't make its way to Europe until 1990. Being the sequel to the original Fantasy Star, this game takes place 1,000 years after the events of the first game, and follows the journey of a local government agent named Rolf and his friends, who are on a mission to discover why the protector of the planet Mota, Mother Brain, has started malfunctioning. The game begins with the main character recalling a strange recurring nightmare he has been having. In the dream, a young girl who he doesn't recognize is battling a demon. Finally, just before the demon would kill her, he awakens. From his home, he goes to the central tower to meet with the head of the government, in order to receive his newest mission. Gameplay is similar to the first Fantasy Star, using a turn-based battle system as well as a menu-based one, where the player chooses commands for their party of up to four characters. There are eight characters in total, each with a different set of preferred weapons and armor, as well as techniques suited to each character's job. The player must defeat the enemies in the overworld and dungeons to advance in the game. However, the game abandoned the first-person view that was used for dungeons and battles. Instead, they use a top-down perspective for exploration and a third-person view in battles. Fantasy Star 2 was a landmark game for the time, not only being billed as the system's biggest game at 6 megabits, but it also has the distinction of being the first RPG for the Sega Genesis, being released in the US two months before the original Final Fantasy would make it to North America. Critics of the time praised its 16-bit graphics and the storyline. This game today still ranks as one of the best games of all time for any system, and it is frequently mentioned amongst many top 100 games lists for the Sega Mega Drive and the Genesis. Overall, I would definitely recommend this game to those of you who love role-playing games, as you will not be disappointed with this entry. So how do you follow that up? Well, with Fantasy Star 3 Generations of Doom. In contrast to the previous entries, Fantasy Star 3 appears at first to take place in a medieval fantasy setting. That is in direct contrast to the science fiction settings of all previous games. In this game, you take control of the Prince Rees, on the day of his wedding to Maya. However, Maya's mysterious past about where she came from or who she is is not yet revealed, and during the wedding ceremony, she is kidnapped. This starts the player off on their adventure. For the most part, this game follows the traditional role-playing formula seen throughout the series, with the exploration of several 2D worlds, character recruitment, and random enemy encounters using a turn-based battle system. The feature that mostly separates this game from the previous entries is that the story spans three generations of characters. At the time of this game's release, some critics saw this game as too different in style from its peers. Other cited criticisms were only subtle differences between the game's endings, lower quality battle animations, and the fact that it did not resolve the perceived cliffhanger from the previous game. As far as I got into the game, I actually did find myself enjoying it, however I wasn't able to play through it as much as I wanted to. One thing I will say that was different from the previous games that took a little bit to get used to was the game's icon-based menu system. Another thing that's a little hard to get around is this game's price, as it seems to be the most expensive out of the series on the Genesis. However, I must admit, I own this game on a variety of other platforms, such as the Virtual Console for the Nintendo Wii, so I have yet to play this on original hardware.
And last on the Sega Genesis from the Fantasy Star series is Fantasy Star 4 The End of the Millennium. This game was released in 1993 in Japan, but didn't make its way to the US until 1995. Building on the previous games, it added a number of new features, such as pre-programmable combat maneuvers called macros, combination attacks between two or more characters, and manga panel illustrations for major cutscenes. It was also the first game in the series to have in-depth character interaction and development. This game returns to the familiar setting of Phantasy Star 2, taking place 1,000 years after the events in that game. You start off by taking control of two hunters, Elise and Chaz, who were hired by a nearby academy to take out monsters. And it is here where the adventure begins. I really enjoyed how this game plays, especially compared to its other two predecessors. I don't know if that's because I actually enjoyed this gameplay style better, or if I'm just getting used to it because I've been playing these games one after the other. The biggest criticism of this game upon release was the storyline. Many described it as routine, frequently incoherent, and derogatory towards women. But I think overall I did enjoy playing this game for its gameplay elements rather than its story. Again, I've not completed this game, having only time to play through the first couple hours of it. But from what I can tell, I actually really enjoyed this game, especially compared to the other two, so if you do start this series, make sure you don't skip over this one. Shining Force is a 1992 fantasy turn-based tactics role-playing video game developed by Climax Entertainment and Sonic Software Planning and published by Sega. It is the direct sequel to the game Shining in the Darkness. However, in terms of the storyline, this game actually takes place before the original. And despite the success of the first game, Sega only allotted a minimal budget to the development of Shining Force. That could be partially the reason why that the English translation of Shining Force has several confusing errors and omissions. For example, the backstory of its main character is entirely left out of the game. This can lead to some confusing moments storyline-wise, as some of the events of the game are not well explained. But anyway, the game opens in the kingdom of Gardana, where the main character is sent on a mission to prevent the evil Cain, who commands the hordes of Runefaust, from opening the Shining Path and resurrecting the Dark Dragon. Battles in the game take place in square grids, with each unit occupying one square. Each unit can move up to a fixed number of squares along the battlefield, determined by its move statistic. Depending on its location relative to its enemies and allies, a unit can also perform an action of attack, cast a spell, use an item, or search the area. Some commands, such as equipping or dropping items, do not count as actions, and therefore can be done in a limited amount of times. The order of turns is determined by the unit's agility score and a random seed. As is common for most RPG games, units become stronger by fighting enemies or performing other actions in battles such as healing allies, with the end goal to gain experience points which allow them to gain levels. In this game, each allied unit is represented by a character with his or her own background and personality, much like in the Fire Emblem series. However, the game developers have stated many times that this game was not influenced by Fire Emblem directly, although many who have played both games have noted many similarities. Overall, this game is okay, but I will note that this is a different type of RPG than many have played in the past. If you're not used to having a tactical style of role-playing game, then you will have a bit of a learning curve before getting used to the battle system. I have been told by others that Shining in the Darkness is the superior game, but since I don't own that in my collection, I actually can't show it here. However, I can tell you that the gameplay style is a lot different than this game. So if this style is not well suited to you, you may want to try Shining in the Darkness first. Sword of Vermilion, to me, is a treasure on the Sega Genesis that is very well hidden. In stark contrast to Fantasy Star and Shining Force, Sword of Vermilion is an action role-playing game developed and published by Sega for the Sega Genesis, making its debut in North America in 1991. And I mean, just listen to that opening theme. But anyway, it was the first console-exclusive game designed by Yu Suzuki, and designed by his Sega AM2 studio. The plot of this game focuses on the son of Eric, king of Excalibra, who takes on a quest of revenge to defeat an evil enemy and free the world of Vermilion from evil. 
The quest consists of traveling to towns and villages, battling creatures to gain experience, and fighting items such as swords, shields, and armor. The gameplay features different views and playstyles differing from more traditional RPGs of the time. The town view uses a typical overhead angle used in most RPGs. The battle view is a tilted overhead view where the player takes full control of the character in real-time combat. The dungeon view is in first person's perspective similar to the first Fantasy Star. And the boss view puts the player up against a boss from a sideways point of view. Critics of the time praised Sword of Vermilion as an excellent and highly compelling arcade adventure RPG, offering a vast, sprawling adventure, particularly praising the arcade format action combat system as great fun and an improvement over Fantasy Star 2's turn-based combat system. I definitely enjoy the battle system in this game, and it is one of the easier ones that I've used on the Sega Genesis so far. The overhead town views are also easy to learn as well. The only thing I had a bit of a learning curve on was the first-person perspective view when you're traveling between towns and in dungeons. But once you get used to that, this is a pretty fun and enjoyable experience. I would definitely recommend this game if you're a fan of RPGs. Ease 3, Wanderers from Ease, was initially developed for home computers in the late 1980s, making its way to home consoles in the early 1990s. Unlike previous entries in the series, Ease 3 uses a side-scrolling perspective rather than the top-down camera view that was used in the past. Other than that, the gameplay is largely unchanged from previous entries in the Ease series. That said though, this game was not as well received. One of the statements I tend to agree with from reviewers of the time is that the game becomes quite tedious. Since you have to follow a prearranged storyline, there's little room for surprise or experimentation, and after a while, the battles, even against more evolved creatures than bugs, seem to be a little bit repetitive. That was just my initial impression after playing this game for only a couple of hours. Beyond Oasis, known in Japan and Europe as The Story of Thor, a successor of The Light, is an action role-playing game developed by Ancient and published by Sega. In this game, the player takes the role of Prince Ali, who has discovered a buried gold armlet that once belonged to a wizard who waged a long war against the evil wielder of the silver armlet. That armlet was used to create chaos and destruction, while the gold armlet had the power to summon four spirits. In terms of gameplay, this game has action-adventure elements similar to the Legend of Zelda series. The player controls Prince Ali and takes him across the maps to fulfill his quest. Along the way, the player picks up special items to restore health and magic, along with special weapons to help him defeat enemies, and four magic spirits found in shrines to aid Prince Ali's mission. The default weapon in the game is the knife, which can perform special attacks and has unlimited usage. Also during the course of the game, the player can equip special weapons such as swords, crossbows, and bombs. However, unlike the knife, these weapons do not have unlimited usage and will break after a set number of uses. This adds a bit of strategy to how much you want to use these weapons. Though I felt the story left something to be desired, this is another one of the RPG games here that I actually enjoyed more for its gameplay. It's not necessarily the perfect fighting system, and I will say that hardcore RPG fans might not like the fact that this game relies mainly on hack and slash and puzzle elements than other RPG elements common in other games. However, when combined with the unique visual style this game offers on the Genesis, I found this to be a bit more appealing and caused me to be a bit more engaged in this game, more so than I did on some of the other RPG titles. So wow, yes, the Sega Genesis is a very capable system when it comes to role-playing games. One thing I will note is that when you start collecting these games for retro consoles, one thing you want to keep in mind is that a lot of the save batteries that are in these consoles have started to go bad. So if you want to save your game, you're going to have to replace these batteries in one form or another so that it'll keep your game saved and you can actually complete the game. A lot of these games were not designed to be beaten in one sitting, so you will have to invest several hours in each game to get through it all. One thing I really like about playing these games now as an adult is that strategy guides are very prevalent everywhere. If you get stuck in a point of the game and you can't figure out how to go forward and you really just want to keep going on with the story, you can look up online someone who has a strategy guide out there 
and very easily get through that part. I know there are some people who say, oh, strategy guides are blasphemy. You really have to figure out the game for yourself. Keep in mind, back in the day, what we would have done is we would have tried to look up game magazines. Some people would have called the 1-800 hotlines for, you know, beating the games and getting tips. But a lot of us would actually start talking to other people who have played the game. And unfortunately, a lot of these games are obscure enough today that I don't think you're going to run into a lot of people in person who have played them. But another thing I like about it is that you can get online and you can find someone who's played this game before and they can help you through some of the parts if they're willing to do that. And I think that the gaming community is usually open enough to where they're willing to do that for you or they'll point you in the direction of the answer. But overall, as I said, I was surprised at the amount of titles that I saw for this console because I'd never played these RPGs as a kid. I was actually scarcely aware of their existence. The Sega Genesis puts out a variety of titles that each offers something just a little bit different that kept me engaged. With the role-playing games out of the way, let's go ahead and move on to some of the puzzle games for this system. Columns is a match-three style puzzle video game that was created in 1989. Early versions of the game were ported across various computer platforms, including the Atari ST. However, in 1990, the game's creators sold the rights to Sega, who ported the game to several Sega consoles. And one thing you may think is that this game is similar to Tetris, and it is. Sega was going to attempt to bring Tetris to the Mega Drive in Japan, however, its sales were blocked. And even though a production run was started on Tetris, all those games were supposed to be destroyed, which is why very few copies still exist today, making it one of the most valuable Sega Genesis games, and the most rare. But even though Columns is in the style of Tetris, it definitely plays a lot differently. Columns of three differently colored jewels fall down from the top, with the player's goal being able to match three jewels in a row. However, just like in Tetris, the game keeps going until the player runs out of room and the top is filled. This game was well received at the time of its release, however, I think I prefer Tetris to this game, but this game isn't bad either. Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine is also another Tetris falling block style puzzle video game. The game's plot is set on a planet that is inhabited by bean-like creatures. Dr. Robotnik conceives of a plan to bring terror to the world by kidnapping the citizens of Beanville and turning them into robot slaves. The player's goal is to face off against Robotnik's henchmen by breaking into the dungeons and freeing the bean-like creatures. So unlike Tetris and unlike Columns, you have to play this game against an opponent. And some of the more astute among you may realize that this game is actually a clone of the game Puyo Puyo, which was released in Japan. The goal is to make beans disappear by matching up colors. If you can plan it so that when certain beans disappear and others will fall into their place, those will disappear as well, you will chain up and attack the opposing player. If the other player's screen fills up before yours does, you win. If not, you lose. And that's pretty much it. Compared to Columns, I definitely like this game better. However, I will admit that I am a bit more challenged at this game as I don't really chain up attacks very well. I also feel that this game is best played with two players as I've always enjoyed playing against another person than I do the computer. Next, we'll take a look at the port of Klax. Since I've already covered how this game is played in the 8-bit war, I'm just simply going to say that this is a welcome upgrade from those graphics, and that this game does play how I would expect it to. One thing I will note is that this game does not really have a soundtrack of any sort that plays through it, just sound effects. So if I was playing this back in the day, I would probably have some other music playing, and I would have the TV muted. But other than that, this game plays like it should, the graphics look great, and there's nothing really I can say about it other than if you like this game, you're going to like it on the Genesis. Oh my, that intro looks beautiful. I may just be saying that because I've just been viewing it in 8-bit graphics recently, but I definitely wasn't expecting it to zoom out to reveal the Lemmings logo. 
Anyway, in case you haven't seen it before in any of my other reviews, this game was everywhere in the early 1990s, and I can tell you that this was kind of the first puzzle game that a lot of people got addicted to other than Tetris. The game is played by getting the lemmings to get to the end goal. You have to do this by assigning certain lemmings jobs so that the rest of them can follow suit. In the early levels, you are introduced to one new concept at a time before they start combining some of them and expecting you to get more and more lemmings in the end goal, increasing the difficulty. Overall, I don't think I've played this game on any other console or controlled quite as nice as it does here. But one thing I do miss is I really wish I had a mouse to control the cursor instead of the D-pad, but that is a minor criticism. The graphics and sound are quite appealing, but again, I think that I probably would have been listening to different music in the background rather than listening to the soundtrack of the game. I'd say even if you're not a big fan of puzzle games, this one may be one you want to try. Pugsy is a combination puzzle and platform video game that was developed by Traveler's Tales and released by Psygnosis. The player takes control of the title character who landed his spaceship on the planet, intending to return home until his spaceship was stolen. The platforming part of the game requires you to defeat various enemies with various means to kill them. The puzzle side of the gameplay is where Pugsy is required to find objects and either carry them to a specific location or somehow use them in order to complete the levels. After playing through this game for a while, I find myself incredibly hooked on it. This game cleverly combines the puzzle and platforming elements into a seamless experience. Critics of the time gave it very good reviews, saying that it was excellently designed and well thought out. However, some critics said that the control system was a weak point of the game. And to a certain extent, I kind of agree with them. It did take me a little while to learn the controls, but I didn't really see the controls as prohibiting me from having a good time playing this game. But other than that, I would definitely recommend this game to gamers of all ages. Even though it's probably more geared towards kids, I found myself having a good time playing it as well. Well, here's a game that has been ported to virtually every platform since its first inception. This is Wheel of Fortune. And I think the main reason why this game has a special place to me is the fact that I used to play this game all the time. In fact, it was this version, but it was a different port of it. I think it was the MS-DOS version. At least it was made by the same developer. In terms of gameplay, it is mostly like the game show we know today, where you go through rounds, solve puzzles, and at the end, if you're the big winner, you get a chance to win an even bigger prize at the very end. One thing I will admit is that this game may not be as interesting to people today who didn't grow up with this system. And I think that's mostly because you can have a more realistic game show experience by playing the more modern versions of this game. And I think one of my major criticisms is that the rounds seem to take a long time, at least longer than they should have taken. I ended up just playing a game by myself so that I can get through it a little bit quicker. But overall, you may have a more enjoyable experience if you play with friends, rather than against the computer. And naturally, another game show that made its appearance on this console is the game Jeopardy. Again, I'm not sure this is a game that a lot of people are going to want to fondly remember today because mainly this game is a product of its time. Keep in mind, if you do play this game today, most of the questions out here are coming close to 30 years old. So I'm not quite sure if they're going to reference things that were current back then, but really have no relevance today, so you might not know the answers. One thing I do want to know about this game that I really don't like at all is the fact that you have to type in your answer and get it spelled correctly to get it right. If you were playing this game on a computer that had a full keyboard, this might not be an issue. But when you have to use the controller and the D-pad to scroll through the letters, Again, going A through Z instead of using something like the keyboard style, it just becomes very tedious very quickly and makes the game not that enjoyable. One thing I will say for this game is that they do seem to give you enough time to get the answer typed in, especially if it's really long, so the time limit doesn't really prohibit you from answering, but your spelling might. You are correct. Now here's a game I have featured on the channel before, but for a different platform. This is Shove It! The Warehouse Game. 
The game I featured before, which is the one this is based on, is called Sokoban. The goal in each level in this game is to shove all the boxes into the end goal. Successfully doing so advances you to the next level. Where the challenge comes in is that you can only push boxes, you can't pull them back. Although this version of the game does have an undo button that lets you move back one move if you make one wrong step. That can be really helpful because the D-pad, in my opinion, is a tad bit too touchy. However, I do find myself making more than one wrong move, and it only lets you go back one, so I pretty much have to restart the level every time I make a mistake. But that's pretty much the premise of the game. I do find a lot of enjoyment out of this kind of puzzle game, and although the early stages are a little simplistic, the later stages provide an ample amount of challenge. Zoom is a puzzle game developed and released by Discovery Software in 1988. In this game, Earth has been captured by space phantoms using magical force fields. The only hope for Earth's survival is for Mr. Smart, a rabbit-like creature, to travel from shield to shield while outrunning the space phantoms in order to save the world. So the end goal of each level is to light up all of the grids without running into any of the enemies. And the gameplay is as simplistic as it gets. You use the D-pad to move around, you have action buttons which make you use power-ups and help you avoid enemies. At certain times during the game, certain power-ups will become available that you can collect, but otherwise it is just survive until you get to the end of the stage. My issues with this game are the soundtrack again, which of course you can mute while you play because it's not really essential to listen to, but the game itself seems to lack visual appeal to me. I don't know if the color schemes that they use here were necessarily ever in style, but they just don't look that appealing to me. The title character doesn't really look appealing as well, and I'm not quite sure what their overall art direction was, or if there ever was a plan for it. I also think the controls are a bit slippery in my opinion, as sometimes I try to go up or down and end up missing a grid, even though I know I'm pressing the button in plenty of time. Luckily this game is not too expensive to collect, so if you're going for a complete collection, this would be one that you would have to get, but not one you might necessarily play often. If I would pick out a game genre that's probably the easiest for casual game players to pick up and play, it would most likely be some of these puzzle games. You know, take a look at a lot of the most popular games on things like Facebook and other social media platforms, like Candy Crush Saga and things like that, they are puzzle games in one way or another. But in terms of playing puzzle games on consoles, that's not really seen as much anymore because part of the reason why people like these puzzle games is that they are portable. And that goes all the way back to the Game Boy and Tetris. But even though a lot of these puzzle games are just a product of their time, I think people will still enjoy them, but just keep in mind that they were designed for a different era of gaming when portability wasn't always necessarily available. And overall, the Sega Genesis just provides a variety of titles that I think will appeal to most people who like puzzle games. Alright, so the last kind of game we're going to look at in this video are going to be the strategy and simulation games. And each of these games is kind of unique enough to where you can't really compare them to each other, so let's go ahead and take a look at each game individually. I'm also going to note that this is where my personal collection is really lacking in a variety of titles, so I'm just showing you the games that I own, not necessarily the best or the worst. So this is interesting. Until researching this game, I actually had no idea that this was only released in Europe for the Mega Drive, because my copy is a Sega Genesis title. And sure enough, come to find out, this is a reproduction title for the Genesis, so this was actually never released for the console during its lifetime. However, this game is actually more of an action shoot 'em up game, originally published for the Amiga in 1993. Virgin ported the game to home computers, and eventually most of the consoles out at the time. Where the strategy comes in is the fact that the player controls a small squad of up to five soldiers. These soldiers are armed with machine guns, which kill enemy infantry with a single round. The player's troops, though, are likewise just as vulnerable. At the beginning of the game, the player possesses superior firepower. However, the enemy infantry becomes more powerful as the game progresses. The player directs their troops through numerous missions, battling enemy infantry, vehicles, and installations. The game itself actually has kind of a dark humor tone, which people at the time both praised and condemned. One thing worthy of note is that its creators intended this game to have an anti-war message. Overall, the gameplay and controls are actually pretty solid in this game, and I actually found myself playing it a bit longer than I thought I would, because I'm not usually a big fan of this style of game. Oh. 
Herzog's Way is another real-time strategy video game developed by Technosoft and published by Sega. Being an early real-time strategy game, it actually predates the genre-popularizing Dune 2. It is actually a sequel to the first game in this series, but that was only released in Japan on the MSX and PC-8801 personal computers. This game kind of combines the arcade style of play from their own Thunder Force series with a simple, easy-to-grasp level of strategy. This game was not a commercial success here in the US, but was much more positively received in Europe. While this game was previously unknown to me going into it, I actually found it kind of enjoyable. But what surprised me the most is that this game is often credited by other game producers, such as the producers of Warcraft, Dune 2, Command and & Conquer, and StarCraft, as this game being a huge influence on those titles. Now here's a game that I play quite often, but I'm more familiar with it on computer than I am on the Sega Genesis. Theme Park is a construction and management simulation game developed by Bullfrog Productions and published by Electronic Arts in 1994. In this game, the player designs and operates an amusement park with the goal of making money and creating theme park crowds worldwide. This game is the first installment in Bullfrog's successful theme series and their designer series. I will say this game is a bit more simplified, especially when compared to its MS-DOS original. Yeah, a few of the rides and features are missing and the graphics are a bit different, but I actually like the art style and the fact that they were able to get this game to work in such limitations. One thing you may want to do though is mute the sound, because that song plays the entire time, on a loop. And in true nostalgic fashion, I was also able to draw my name in the park like I used to as a kid. LHX Attack Chopper is a 1990 war helicopter simulation game originally released on PC by Electronic Arts. And while I have a lot of good things to say about the MS-DOS original, I don't think it translated very well to the Sega Genesis. My biggest complaint about this game is that it seems that the system's limitations are what's holding this game back. There's a horribly choppy frame rate, and everything on the screen just looks plain and boring. I mean, overall, I don't see really a reason to try to play this game on the Genesis, because it was much better done on PC. And another game that I tried out was Steel Talons. Again, as judged by the frame rate, which sometimes dips down to one frame a second, this shows that the Genesis wasn't really built to run a game of this caliber, which is really unfortunate. So there you have it. We covered a variety of different games in this video that were mostly geared towards strategy. And I think that this system provides a lot of great games that I don't think a lot of people would have played back in the day because they just weren't as popular as they are today. So for modern gamers who are wanting to go back and play some of these games, I would definitely recommend checking out a few of the titles featured in this video. You may like them, you might not, but it's definitely going to give you a feel for what these games were like for us back in the mid-90s. Alright, so we covered a variety of genres in this video, and of course there are going to be games that fell off my radar. Some of them I don't own, but a lot of them I may not even have heard of yet. If you guys have any future suggestions for games I should check out on this system, please let me know in the comments below. I'd really like to see what you guys think, and look forward to trying out some of those games you suggest. That said, that is going to wrap it up for this video. In the next video, we're going to take a look at probably one of the biggest genres that helped push sales of the Sega Genesis, and that is sports. Remember, if you like what you see, please hit that like and subscribe button. It really helps me out and supports this channel. Again, I want to thank you all so much for watching, and stay tuned because I have more content coming. I'll see you in the next one. If you like this video and you'd like to help out with future projects on this channel, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Again, I want to thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.